All right, I'm going to be preaching on a subject this morning. I think it's um, just very timely with a lot of events that are going on these days. And what I'm going to preach on this morning is racism and what we're going to learn from the Bible about racism and stuff. Now, racism is something that's always been around. It's always been out throughout history, and I believe it's always going to be here until Christ comes back. There's always people that are going to associate with groups and think that they're better than other people just based on the, the color of their skin or their ethnicity or whatever. There's always reason for that. It's just kind of, it's, it's unfortunately part of uh, the sinful human nature where, where people band together and they, they want to find um, similarities or whatever. Whatever the reasons are, it doesn't even really matter. Um, it's, it's false. It's wicked. We're going to see what the, the Bible teaches about this. But there's propaganda being fed to the public right now. And I believe it's out to foment a race war. That there's, that there's agendas that the, the, you know, the spiritual wickedness in high places, the, the, evil, the rulers of the darkness of this world, are trying to, to cause a lot of uh, turmoil and pit people against each other in many ways. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's an economic collapse coming in this country and I believe even worldwide. We know that the Antichrist is coming. We know the prophecy. We know that there's going to be a one world government. We know there's going to be a system of currency or payment that is only going to be allowed through the mark of the beast to do away with all, you know, in order for a system like that to be set up, you're going to have to have all this turmoil, the wars, everything else that's going to happen. We know that this is going to happen. And it only makes sense then when you look around to see why is so much of the, of the attention and the media focus in certain areas? And, it's, and it is very specific. And just recently, we've, we've seen that. Now, we've been shown for a long time, for example, you know, the skinheads, the KKK, the Nazis, and I am not for any of these groups, right? Just for the record, in case someone wants to twist my words later, you know, but they've been displayed in a bad light for a really long time. And rightfully so. Okay, rightfully so. But what about La Raza? La Raza is a group maybe you're not familiar with, I don't know, but like especially in California and in Arizona and um, in Texas, these groups are big because it's a Mexican group. And the word La Raza, it literally means the race. The race. Now, you'll have the white supremacists get called out all day for being, you're racist, you know, the white power and all this other stuff, and just being completely, you know, um, destroyed in the media and the public opinion because they're racist. But then you have a group like La Raza, which literally means the race, because they think that the Mexican or the, the Hispanic race is superior and that, like, they're fighting for the cause of their race, that that's not racist. You know, anything other than, than white is not racist. You can have a group that's all about the race, just your race. But that's not, you know, the white people are saying, hey, we're about the white race and we're about, you know, the Caucasian or whatever, you know, we're about this Anglican race. We're, you know, this is what we want to preserve. And that's racist. But then every other group, whether it's, you know, Mexican, black, whatever, the, you know, and what I mean by that is, you know, obviously we can see well, that's just as racist as the other, but that's not what the media is portraying. That's not what you're being told by the people who are providing information by and large to the public. There's an agenda. Why are they never called out for their blatant racism? Now, I don't bring this up because I'm white and I think, you know, oh, the KKK is just getting a bad rap. You know, like, and I'm just upset that, oh, why are you picking on my, my white people and you're not picking, you know, no. That's not it at all. It's just dishonest and hypocrisy that I'm calling out. It's not, that it has nothing to do with the color of my skin. Anybody that knows me knows that there's not a racist bone in my body. That I don't, I mean, I don't care what color your skin is or what complexion you have. That means nothing. And we're going to get into the Bible teaching on that anyways. But I've never been like that. Now look, I've grown up in an area where there were quite a few racist people. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, but in a suburb that was surrounded by black communities, but our community was really, really white. I mean, there was like, I don't think I had, we had a, you know, over 400 people in my uh, graduating class in high school, and like not one of them was, was you know, African-American or black, you know, not, not one of them that I can recall. And, and like my whole high school was like that. So that was the area I grew up in, and I had friends, and I knew friends that had family members that they were racist. I mean, they didn't, they didn't like black people at all and would make comments all the time and stuff. Now, I wasn't like that. 
But that's how people were. So I get it. And I'm not going to say today that racism doesn't exist because it does and it always has. And I think it will until Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom and makes things right. It's going to happen. But now we see today, you know, like the, this Black Lives Matter movement that, that's been real big. And, you know, I don't want to get too big into their platform and stuff. And I get what they're trying to say is that, like, you know, because it's just real broad. There's a lot of people speaking for a movement that really doesn't have a leader. So you could, see, you could kind of pick out people from all different areas to try to say who, what the group stands for. But I'm not even going to get into that because it, that's not the point here. Um, but from all the recent killings, from Ferguson to Baltimore and all these things that were being shown, all were being shown are... The tragic events, right? And, um, you know, I don't claim to know the truth in all of these events. One of the problems, and you have to be aware of this in general, just when it comes to media, and you see clips of videos, never be too quick to judgment on any of them because you don't know the whole story. You're seeing a segment, even if it, you know, it's, it's video, the video doesn't lie, the video it captures what's happening. But you don't know all of the events leading up to event or what has been said necessarily and everything going on. And it could look real bad in one section. But when you get the entire story and, and know everything, the facts of what happened, it can change things a little bit. You know? And for example, I think one of the recent shootings that happened... There was a guy, and I don't know his name or anything, but the guy that was selling the CDs out in front of the store... I read in a news article, in one news article, and I didn't see this anywhere else, but the call they were responding to is that a guy said that he threatened to kill him, which is what they were responding to, because they make it appear that, oh, here's just some guy selling CDs. Why you got to bother the guy selling CDs, right? Like, why are you harassing him? Like, what's the big deal, right? It's just because he's black. And that's the, the, what's being portrayed in the vast majority of the media. But then when you start to hear, well, wait a minute, they were responding to a call of someone who said, like, he was being threatened to be killed. And then you find out the guy had a gun on him. And it's like, it, it should change things. Now, I'm not saying that the way that they handled the situation was the best way they could have dealt with it. I'm not saying the guy should have died. You know, but there's a way that you can view these things without automatically jumping the gun and just saying, well, they just did it because they're racist and they wanted to kill him. If that were the case, why wouldn't they have just shot him in the first place? You know, without even having all the struggle and getting on him and tackling, you know, and, and, and trying to arrest him and everything else. I mean, if it was just because of his skin color, then why wouldn't they just walked up to him and it's been boom? I mean, do you really think that these people are trying to, to just kill black people? Because I don't. Now look, I am not pro-cop, pro-police officer. Like, like, there is way too much abuse and problems and I don't even think we need I definitely don't think we need a public police force that's what I believe I don't, and I don't I'm not for you know I'm sick and tired of the harassment and abuse and our liberties being taken away and being you know and just just all the problems we have with the police force so I'm not pro-police, but you have to be able to look at, at what is going on and look at the facts for what it really is and not just accept what the media is trying to cram down your throat and what they want you to believe about a situation. Amen. For example, another, you know, the, the Freddie Gray case was the one where the guy was put in the back of the paddy while he was arrested and I believe he probably got banged up. I mean, they, they probably gave him the, the rough ride or whatever. It, it, that's probably what happened. But why is it not mentioned that the man that was driving the vehicle was black himself? I mean, they want to make it about race. But the guy who would have actually caused the injuries for his death that was driving the vehicle was black himself. Don't buy into the false narrative that's being spelled out for you. Now look, if that guy really did that stuff... He's wicked. He ought to be punished. He ought to be put to death for causing someone else to be put to death or at least, you know, a, a, a um, manslaughter charge or something. I mean, something to be responsible. And again, I don't know the facts. I just, just from my viewpoint, from what I've been able to see, it looks like that's probably what happened. And that's a shame and that's wrong and that's wicked. But to blame it on race is completely wrong also. And the big problem I see 
is not the race problem. It's the, for one, it's the accountability problem with the police. It's like police officers can just do anything and they never seem to get punished. And when they do get punished, it's a little slap on the wrist. And you know what? That is one of the things that's making people extremely angry. Now, people get a little bit misdirected on the cause of that and thinking, oh, it's just because of race. No, that's just because you're being shown specific crimes where it's a white on black. See, they don't show you the black on black. They don't show you the white on white. I read some statistics, and you know, you got to be careful with statistics, too, because they could be used to say all kinds of different things, which is why I don't even want to cite the source right now, because I didn't vet it enough and really read into it enough. But just when you, when you go based off of sheer numbers, just total body count, more white people have been killed by police officers than black people. But that doesn't fit the narrative. Now, there is a higher percentage of white population as opposed to black population. And when you account for that, it makes it more equivalent, but not quite because then there's also, you, could, you, you have to look at the, well, there, I mean, I don't know. I didn't want to get into all the statistics, but when you hear things like that and you see things like that, it's like, well, you're, you're led, I'm led to believe that, you know, whites have this white privilege and nothing bad ever happens to white people. They don't ever get harassed by police. They don't ever get shot. They don't ever get killed. Nothing ever wrong or bad ever happens to them by cops because they have a pass because of their skin color. But anybody else of color, you know, they just are constantly, continually, always harassed and just and always being shot and killed and whatever. I mean, that, that's just the, the perception that's being painted. And it's not true. I believe the real problem is the militarization of the police. Amen. The police are being trained and taught that everybody is a potential killer of you. That every time you go out, you might not make it back home. And they, they get pumped with this, with this information of just, you never know, someone's going to pull a gun and shoot you and kill you. When the vast majority of people aren't like that. I mean, yeah, there's some crazy people out there. But how often is that really happening? Right. And you look at the escalation of force being used now and the cops using methods, you know, the less than lethal or less lethal of the, the tasers and stuff, and then it's used it for pain compliance. It's like, oh, I'm telling you to do something, and again, it's power trip, and if you don't do it because you have rights as a human being, God-given rights to just not bow down to everything that you say just because you're wearing a uniform, and they just say, well, <laughs> you're going to listen. <laughs> you know, and, or pull out their gun or whatever. You know, that's ridiculous and that's a problem. Right. But that's the real problem. And that's, it's, that, it's that escalation of force and it's the tactics of handling people and going to a situation and de-escalating it instead of escalating it and getting all puffed up and thinking that because, look, and you know what, sometimes people can be jerks. But if you're going to be in a position of a law enforcement, you have to be able to deal with people being jerks. And if you can't deal with it, then you ought not to have that job. Amen. Too many times these people get their toes stepped on and they want to show you who's, I really have the authority. And that's when problems happen. And that's when people get arrested for no reason. That's when people get beat up. That's when all of the abuse happens. Right. And that's the real problem. Now, again, does racism exist? Yes. Are there racist police officers? I'm sure there are. Do they sometimes target people for their color? I bet they do. But is that the big, major problem that we're seeing? No, it's not. That, that, is, that is such a smaller focus to the overwhelming problem that we have. And see, when you're focused on the wrong problem, when you're focused on the minor, on a smaller thing, you're never going to solve the problem. It's only going to get worse and worse. But see, I think the reason why it's being propagated is because they want to have a racist mentality to the point where now we had what happened in Dallas with the, man, the, with the black man that, that shot all those police officers and supposedly he wanted to shoot cops and white people. And it's, you know, just, just seeing what the media is just showing you over and over about, you know, black people are being killed by white people. Black people are being killed by white people. Black people killed by white people. To where they say, you know what? We've had it. And they feel like they're at war because they've been getting the propaganda just pushed on them that these white people are evil. They want to kill you. And, they, you know, without taking a step back and thinking about it. And they're buying into the propaganda of the media. Now, not everyone is, of course. I mean, that would be silly of me to say that all black people think this. No, they don't. 
But again, that's the type of brush that the media wants to paint with to make you think that, to even to make white people think, well, all black people think that. No, they don't. But you get the unstable guys, like the, like the guy in Dallas, and they're going to take it and go, and go and do these things. But um, since so many people are focused on the race anyway, since it is an issue, since it is coming up in the, in the, in the mainstream media, let's look at what the Bible teaches about this. Because let's just see where, where we ought to stand as God's people. Even though we know that these issues aren't really about the race, let's just see what the Bible teaches about this. So we're going we're to look at the Bible and, uh, and, and study this a little bit. Now, God likes to have separate nations. He likes people being separated in their own groups. He separated at the beginning, you know, at the, the Tower of Babel after the flood, Noah got the ark, and people started to... to um, multiply on the earth they all stayed in one place and then they tried to build this tower unto heaven right the tower of babel and god confounded their language so that they had to just split up and go off and live in their own areas and from that point on you know god has always wanted there to be separate nations that's why he chose the na you know israel he chose abraham to give it you know to, to to make a covenant with and to give promises to and to his seed and that they grew and he promised this land to them and you know, God had a perfect will for all of that and he established borders and said, this is where you guys are going to live. He didn't pick a people and say, you're going to conquer the whole world and you're going to rule the whole world under my righteous judgment. He didn't say that. He said, this is the area, this is the spot, you're the people and, and you're going to have your own nation and there's going to be nations around you and he gave laws on dealing with all that and everything else, but... He, that was the nation that he was going to deal with. And anyone that wanted to come and be a part of that nation, we're welcome to. But he didn't say global government. And he's never said global government. The one who's saying global government is Satan. He's the one who's going to have the one world government. Now, so where did the races come from? Obviously, we know that you know, God created Adam and Eve. We believe the Bible to be true. We believe it to be literally true. That what it says, we believe. We don't scoff at it and say, oh, there's no way that could have possibly happened. Yes, it did. Amen. God created man out of the dust of the earth, and he created woman from the rib of, of man, and they too became one flesh, had children. Their children, obviously, then had to marry and bear children and continue on and on from a family tree where Adam and Eve are at the top and it goes down and builds all the branches, okay? Now, the flood came, so it was just Noah and his, and his sons and their wives. So it got whittled back down again, the family tree, but then opened up again to where we're at today. Now, the, the, the races, if you want, I believe there's only one race, first of all. There's the human race. The Bible says that we're all of one blood. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and bounds of their habitation. We're all made of one blood. Right. The outside may look a little bit different, but inside the blood is all the same. I mean, it all stems from the same place, from the same source. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. It goes to Noah and his wife, and, you know, and then prior to that, Adam and Eve, ultimately we all have genetics or DNA that would come from those two as our ultimate, you know, oldest ancestors that we have on this earth. So we all have that same thing. Now, the, uh, the diff why are there different races? Why are there different colors and stuff? Well, it's easy when you, when you realize, that's why I brought up the Tower of Babel, when people started to, to split off, well, they're going to be for the vast majority, breeding within their own group. So when these sections all kind of split off, they're going to continue to have children and interbreed within their group. And anyone who knows a little bit about husbandry or breeding and stuff like that knows you can breed traits into people. Now, this one isn't specific uh, like on purpose, trying to breed traits out of humans. But if you figure, you know, Adam and Eve had all of the characteristics, all the DNA, everything in their DNA. I mean, just, just for all different types of, of human characteristics. Some are dominant, some are recessive. They were all there, though, at the beginning. And the more you, 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 you know, breed within the, within the same group, those recessive ones are going to come out and become more dominant. And it, I mean, it makes sense. And, and, and it fits perfect with real science today. You can see it. We do it with our dogs. When we breed our labs, our white labs, we breed them for the white, we find other ones, and we can make them, you know, they've gotten whiter and whiter. Really, technically, there's, there's only, uh, the classifications are 
black, chocolate, and golden, right? Or yellow, to yellow. But, so technically we have yellow labs, but anyone who's seen my dogs, are they yellow or are they white? I mean, if you just looked at them and said, what color are these dogs? You're going to say they're white. Because they've been bred so much for that characteristics, characteristic of having that real white fur. And you can do that. And you can do that with animals. So if you could do that with animals and it's obvious and it's, and it's, and it's shown, it only makes sense that it's the same thing has happened with people. You know, have groups of people in various regions of the earth, and especially when travel wasn't as easy as it was today. I mean, it's a lot harder for someone of, of one nation, one part of the world, or one part of, the, of a continent to go and have children with someone way over on the other side. I mean, it's just, it's just not happening very frequently. So you have groups and these different traits come up. And that's where you have, you know, different hair texture and pigmentation of the skin and, you know, other different attributes, some, some physical features and shapes around your eyes and around your nose and around your lips, you know, whatever. All these things, just, just small things that come up as a result of um, breeding within the same group of people. But it all stems back to the same place. So, yes, people look a little bit different from each other but we're still got the same blood running through our veins. And that's why I believe ultimately there's only one race. It's a human race. It's, you know, people. And, and what that's called is natural selection. Now there's, you know, they kind of use that term with evolution a lot. And, and uh, so I don't want you to get too confused, but it's, it, it's technically it would be called natural selection where you, through uh, separation and breeding within the same gene pool that, that causes the differences that we see today. Now, we started off in Deuteronomy chapter 7 because I wanted to touch on this subject just real briefly um, on interracial marriage because there are still some people believe, today that believe that it's wrong and that it's unbiblical, which... I can't find that at all in Scripture. I'm, and, I'm, and I started here with Deuteronomy 7.1 because if anyone's going to turn to any type of support for, for having, you know, for not agreeing with an interracial marriage, this is probably one of the places they're going to turn to to prove that. But I'm just going to show you why it's just completely false. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, look at verse number 1 again. It says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Prizites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and, mightier than, greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy on them. Now, when the children of Israel were brought into the promised land, that was the orders from God. Wipe them all out. He said, I want you, you need to just destroy them all. And it was only for these specific nations that God was bringing judgment upon. It, is not for all, it was not for all nations of the world. It's not for anyone that got into a war with. Their, their, their um, orders were not to kill men, women, children, you know, just, just everything in their sight. Only for these people, because God was bringing judgment on them, and he explains that in Leviticus, where he's saying, look, he gave the law, you know, the people that were here, they did all these things. And that's why they're being judged, and that's why you're wiping them all out. But that's not what happened. The people of the land, they didn't wipe everybody out. They ended up getting deceived in one area where they made a covenant with them, so they didn't destroy them. And then in other areas, they didn't fully trust in God. They didn't, they didn't just finish the job they were supposed to do, and they became a thorn. And it says in verse 3 here, it says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And people could point to this and say, see, look, God's saying not to, not to mingle with the heathen, not to, not to, to marry or give in marriage for the, you know, between you and these other people of the land, these foreigners, these strangers in the land. But that's not really what he's saying. It's not because 
their race is pure and they need to keep their race pure. None of that comes up. No, God is not a respecter of persons. We'll get into that a little bit later. But it's saying here not to make marriages with these heathen people, with these people that were supposed to have been destroyed. And he gives the reason why. The reason why you don't marry those people is because they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods because they didn't worship the Lord. They were unbelievers. They were heathen. They worshiped false gods. And you know what? That commandment is still in effect today in the New Testament of not being unequally yoked. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And this is another verse I've actually heard people say, oh, we're not supposed to be unequally yoked together. That means you have to stay within your own race. When it clear, I mean, the context of the scripture is telling you exactly what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with your skin color. It's talking about... Communion with light and darkness, good and evil, worshipers of the Lord and worshipers of false gods. It says, you know, what concord, what agreement is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is the devil, okay? So why would you as a Christian, you're saying, why would you worship someone who's a Satan worshiper? That's being unequally yoked together. You've got orders from God to do God's will, and you're going to marry someone who's, who's following Satan? I mean, that's what he's talking about. This is what this means to not be unequally yoked together. And yoked, you're, you're, you know, the yoke of, of oxen is a, the instrument that gets put over their necks to, so that they could plow and do work together. You need to be yoked with someone who's going to do the work with you that has the same faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's talking about. I mean, it's, it's, it's plain and simple. If you, don't get, if you can't get that from the context, then I, I don't know how else I can help you. You're just not reading or you have a preconceived idea on what you want to believe or what you want to make it say because that's not what it says. Deuteronomy 7 and 2 Corinthians 6 are saying the same thing for the same purpose. And that's where we see even the example of Solomon was given when he married many strange wives that turned his heart away from serving the Lord. He married wives of all over the place, all these different nations and stuff. And then what happened in the end? He ended up building altars to false gods and failed at the end of his life because his heart was turned away from serving the Lord. It's not because they had a different skin color. It's not because their complexion was different, their hair was different, their eyes looked a little bit different. That had nothing to do with it. It's what's in their heart that mattered. It's that they weren't believing in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39 says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, unless they're not of her race. Oh, wait, no, that's not what it says. It says, only in the Lord. Liberty, freedom. A wife, nonetheless, a woman. You know, a lot of people like to say, oh, women don't have a choice. It's just, no. The wife, the, the, a wife who's widowed, her husband's dead. She's freed from the law. From the law, she could go and marry. She has liberty to marry who she wants to marry, who she desires. Who is it that I want to get married to? I can pick from anybody. Well, only in the Lord. Again, lines up with the other passage we read. They've got to be a believer. They've got to believe a believer, believer in Christ. That is my criteria. That is the, the pool of people I'm, that I'm choosing from are born-again believers. But I have liberty to choose whoever that is. And look, there's born-again believers from all races from all nations, from all kindreds, from all tongues. The Bible says that that's who's going to be in heaven. There's going to be representatives from all nations, all kindreds, all tongues in heaven. Amen. Turn to Leviticus 19. We're going to look at what... Cause, and that's with marriage. I, it's ridiculous to me how anyone... You know, I've never heard a good argument for it because there's not one from the Bible. But it's so clear on, on what the criteria is for finding a spouse. It has nothing to do with your, with your ethnicity or the color of your skin. It's ridiculous. Leviticus 19. Now, I think that naturally a lot of people are just more attracted to, to people within their, own, within their own racial group just for whatever reason. I, I think that maybe it's just something that you're used to, your comment, whatever you find uh, association with. But that does not mean it's a law or rule or what you have to do. I mean, because there's still plenty of people who find attraction outside of their own, you know, 
whatever. I, uh, when we look at the scripture, the scripture is clear. Leviticus 19, look at verse 33, because there's a God's law dealing with foreigners. So imagine, if you would, now Leviticus, in Leviticus 19, he's talking to the children of Israel. He's giving the law to Moses. Moses giving it to the children of Israel, who, by and large, were physically of the seed of Abraham. Right? I mean, they, they were descendants, and they had their genealogies, and they, and they knew where they descended from. So they're, they're children of Abraham, but look at what it says in dealing with a foreigner. So a foreigner is someone who just comes into your land that's not that does not have that heritage, does not have that ancestry. Verse number, um, thirty-three, Leviticus nineteen, verse thirty-three. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. So if someone comes in, a stranger, someone that maybe looks a little bit different, someone a different complexion, someone that that's not of your heritage or your lineage. He says, you shall not vex them. What does vex mean? You're not going to be troubling them. You're not going to be you know, causing them problems because they look different. In God's law, he's saying, don't vex them. Verse 34, But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. You say, you treat him just like everybody else, just like your brother. And thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. He said, not only do not vex them, you treat them just like anyone else you would treat, and you love them as yourself. Amen. That's what God feels about strangers or someone who looks different or someone of another nationality, someone of another race. You treat them with love and respect just like you would anybody else. It makes no difference what they look like. Amen. And you will not find in Scripture anywhere that will tell you otherwise than what this verse is saying right here. Now, this was in God's Old Testament law. So you would think that the Jews would have known this. Yet they still prided themselves on being the physical seed of Abraham all the way through the time of Jesus Christ. And especially in that time. Turn, if you would, to um, Acts chapter 10. And when you look through the book of Acts, we did a, uh, a Bible study through the book of Acts. And in that Bible study, we found after chapter after chapter after chapter, there were many times where you can see the pride of being a Jew. You could see the pride of being a physical seed. And um, we got one example here. We're not going to turn to all of them, but in Acts chapter 10, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And this is, of course, when Peter had his vision of the, um, you know, the animals coming down from heaven in a basket and everything. And he didn't understand what that means. So, but what he was saying, he was talking to people saying, you know that right now, in the time that he was living in, it's an unlawful thing for a Jew to go and keep company with someone from another nation. He's like, you can't even go and visit people from another nation. Now, that is not scripture. Right. But that was the Jewish tradition and the Jewish laws at that time that they established, the traditions of men and the laws of men that they were told to keep. And see, they were brought up with this type of thinking to where even Peter had to be corrected on this and God had to show them, like, look, you don't call any man common or unclean. And because at the same time, of course, he was being called of... Um, from an Italian group of people and to go in unto them and to teach the God, you know, to preach unto them and everything else. So God, God had given them this vision to tell them, look, go and do this. You know, just because your, you know, your Jewish law is telling you you're not supposed to do this, I'm telling you to do this. And we can see from the Old Testament, we just saw, look, you treat them exactly like anybody else. So along the way, along the path, this had gotten perverted. This had gotten twisted and forgotten. John chapter 4, verse 9. You don't have to turn. I'll turn if you go to Galatians chapter 2. John 4, 9 says, Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, hast this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans were actually part Jew. 
They had the Jewish blood, but they had been mingled in with the heathen more, and they didn't have the pure, you know, the pure bloodline and the genealogy going back. And you know, it was only the Jews that, that could still kind of claim that. You know, after they came back from Babylon, where some of them had still kind of kept their their line pure or whatever. And we see that so this is the same thing when Jesus is talking to um, the woman at the well. And you say, well, wait a minute. Why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You know, the Jews don't deal with the Samaritans. And that's known. And this is the way that their culture was. They say, you know what? We are Jews. And we don't talk to anyone else. And we don't have conversation with them. And we don't have anything to do with them. That's racist. And it's not right according to the Bible. It's, no, it's found nowhere in Scripture. If, uh, people doing it is found in Scripture all the time. But it's, it's rebuked and it's wrong. It's not right. Look at Galatians chapter 2, 11. We're going to see where the Apostle Paul rebukes Peter to his face for this very problem. Galatians 2, verse 11. And Galatians 2 gives us more detail on, on an event that actually happened in Acts. And you see, you know, when you read through the book of Acts, you, you, um, you get this event, but not with all of this detail. In uh, Galatians 2, Paul's recounting what happened and gives us some more information. Galatians 2, verse 11, the Bible reads, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So what's happening here is that at first, Peter's fine. He's, he's sitting down. He's breaking bread. He's eating with the Gentiles. No problem, right? Because he knows that no man is common or unclean. But then these other guys come from James. And when they get there, he feared them which were of the circumcision. Now, this isn't even talking about necessarily believers. This is talking about people who were Jews that were circumcised and they were trusting in that. And they held to that belief of, you know, we don't deal with anyone else. So when they showed up, Peter was afraid of what they would think or what they would say or what they did say, and he separated himself. He stopped doing what was right and just treating everybody like normal, like you should anybody else, and love, love them as yourself, and separated himself and stopped doing that. And verse 13 says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. See, as soon as Peter did it, then all the other people followed his lead. It only took that one person... To, to, to be wrong and incorrect on this and to make that move and now all of a sudden you've got a lot of people following him. Right. So he's leading a lot of people astray. It was a really bad situation in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. And even Barnabas, Barnabas was a great, I mean, hey, Peter was a great guy. He was a great disciple. He did a lot of work for the Lord. So was Barnabas. He did all kinds of evangelizing and preaching and going out into these foreign nations and preaching the gospel unto the heathen and unto the Gentiles. He did that, but he was carried away with Peter in their dissimulation and separating themselves from the people. It says in verse 14, though, but see, Paul corrects this. He says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And he calls them out saying, you know, how can you now want to try to follow this law of the Jews, which you know is wrong? And you're going to try to compel them to live like the Jews live? And he, and he, said, and he makes a point here. He says, he, st he, he confronted him before everybody. Because everybody was being involved and in, in is breaking away from, from what was right. So he needed to make this public and clear before everybody. It was a public rebuke saying, look, Peter, you're wrong. You were right before, but now this, is, this has got to stop because this is not what the gospel is about. This is not what the, the truth is about. And of course, the, the famous words in Matthew 3, 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Trusting in your heritage or, or um, you know, lifting up or elevating. Because that's what they were doing at this time. The Jews at this time were, we're, the, we're the children of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, we're the seed of Israel. 
and they really puff themselves up in their racial identity. And they get rebuked in Matthew 3. You know, John the Baptist is like, you know, don't think that just because you're a physical seed of Abraham that that means anything. He says, God's able these stones, these, this inanimate object, if he wants to raise seeds on Abraham, he could do that with these stones. It means nothing. Just because you came physically descended from a man for, you know, a thousand years ago or whatever, it doesn't mean anything. That's right. But what I think is real bizarre today, turn if you go to Galatians, you're in Galatians 2, right? We're going to look at Galatians 3. What I think is bizarre today is that we have Christians today that are racist. And I don't just mean the racism of like white versus black or like the, the common racism that you hear about and see today. They believe that the physical seed of Abraham is somehow better than everybody else right. just by the mere chance that they were born into this, into this family. Right. And I'm here to tell you today, it's false. That's right. There is nothing special or better about people who are physical descendants of Abraham today any more than it was back in Jesus' day, in John the Baptist, when he says, you know what? Don't trust in Abraham, your father. Amen. But even Christians today are deceived into thinking that the Jews are special people of God and they're the chosen people and they're, you know, that, that somehow, some people even think that by nature of being a Jew that like they have this, this free pass into heaven. That they think that like the gospel doesn't apply to them and well, they're Jews. And people are, and the Christians are always looking and say, well, let's just see what the Jews say about this and you know, what is their understanding of the Old Testament? Look, if they reject Christ, I don't want to have anything to do or learn from them about what they believe because it's false. Right. I mean, what do you think the apostles were trying to do then? They were trying to win them to Christ. The Jews, they didn't have a special ticket. They needed salvation by grace through faith like everybody else in this whole world does. Amen. Now, don't think that I'm standing up here and just saying, oh, you hate the Jews. No. I don't elevate their status above anybody else, though. And you shouldn't either. We shouldn't do that with, you shouldn't do that with your own race. You shouldn't do that with someone else's race. You shouldn't do that with the Jews. I don't care who it is. No one race is better than another. We're all of one blood. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 6. Galatians 3 is so crystal clear, though, on this subject of the promises and how the, you know, the, the, um, how we should even view the Jews are like, are they, are they an elevated status? Does it matter that they're physical seed of Abraham or not? Galatians 3, verse number 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that, ye, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So when you want to look at the promises made to Abraham and to his seed, and you want to look at all the blessings, and anywhere that you do find some kind of a mention of it being a good thing that you're a child of Abraham, because those verses exist, and I'm not going to go through all of them, it's just, there's just not enough time. Um, when you see that, you can look at Galatians 3 and understand that those promises weren't just for physical seed. It's never been about the flesh. It's never been about the physical. It's always been about the spiritual. Always. Your flesh cannot say, that's why we're not saved by our works, because that's our flesh. We're saved through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual salvation. It's a spiritual children of Abraham. And that's why it says, they that are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. If you are of faith, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are a child of Abraham today. Amen. That is what the Bible is saying here. We're going to keep reading here. Look at verse number 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee, in thee, in Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, are all nations the physical seed of Abraham? Nope. Of course not. But in him, all the nations shall be blessed. That's a quote from the Old Testament, the quote that you know, people don't want to turn to. They just think, oh, well, it's just through Abraham, because Abraham has a blessing, and to his seed, which just means the, the physical Jews. No, no, you're missing the whole point of the Bible. It's not about that at all, and it never has been, and it never will be. It's about salvation. It's about the faith in God. 
That's what makes you a child of God. That's what makes you a child of Abraham. Verse 9 says it again. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Those blessings that Abraham is receiving falls on those that be of faith. We're going to jump down to verse number 16 now in, in Galatians 3. I mean, just for sake of time, I mean, go, when you go home, read all of Galatians 3. Read all of Galatians. Read, you know, th th it, it spells it out so clearly. But verse number 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And again, you go back and, and it boggles my mind how the, how the people who want to say that, the, no, the Jews are special and they have all these promises of God and they turn to the verse that says the promise is unto his seed and they say, see, it's unto the children of Israel. Galatians 3 says specifically it's not to the physical children. He said not seeds, plural. That was to Christ. Many of those promises and stuff are, are fulfilled in Christ, not in all of the physical seed of Israel. It says in verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And there's this big distinction, again, all throughout the Bible, between the law and promises. The child of the flesh and the child of faith. Ishmael was a child of the flesh. When, when Abraham and Sarah didn't have their faith in God and wanted to do things their way, and they used their handmaid, Hagar, to have a child, that was a physical process. That was them trying to make their own seed but that was not the seed that was promised unto them by God. That's where Isaac comes in. And you see the allegory, you know, that's taught in Romans 9 and Romans 11. You're going to see in Galatians 3. All throughout the Bible, there's this distinction between the law and the promises. Promises require faith. If someone just promise, if they say, hey, brother, I promise you, next week, I'll do so and so for you. I'll do this and so. I'll give this to you. You have to just take that in faith. You have no evidence. You have nothing to see about that. There's no law dictating that. It's just my word. Do you believe my word? It's a promise. Well, God also gave a law, right? And the law came, that's what we're saying in verse uh, 17, 430 years after the promise. God made the promise first, and then later on he gave this law. And you know what? And part of that law is when they had their physical nation outlined and when they had all of those other things established and the um, the um, all the different laws were passed on, but he says the promise was given unto Abraham. And so if the inheritance is of the law, it's no more a promise. If a law just dictates that this is what you get, he said that's not of a promise. That's not of faith. But the inheritance, God, it says God gave it to Abraham by promise. And it's that faith that, um, that allows you to even receive the promises. It's not the law. It's not the genealogy. It's not being a Levite. It's not being a, a particular tribe of, uh, of Israel. Jump down to verse 26 here in Galatians 3. The Bible reads, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Just like John chapter 1, right? Uh, but as many as received him, they, to them gave you power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Same exact concept. Hey, if you have faith in Christ Jesus, you are a child of God. Amen. And you have an inheritance by virtue of being a child. It's an inheritance. It's not, it's not of the law. It's just that's what you receive by, by being born into that family. Verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It's kind of repetitive, isn't it? I mean, didn't we just see almost the same exact statement? How much more clear can you ask for to be considered Abraham's seed? If you're Christ's, you're Abraham's seed. It's that simple. And... Yeah. 
again, if, you, if, if anyone has a problem with this, you know, I don't know what else I can do to help them other than just, just pointing to these scriptures because you, you either are just blinded, you know, you, you, you can't see the truth because you're not saved, or you have something else in your heart that makes you want to believe something different than just allowing the scripture to teach you what is being taught on this subject. Um, turn if you go to Romans chapter 2. We're going to see more evidence for this. All right, I'm all, okay. I'm doing okay on time. Just need to make sure because there's so much evidence. I mean, I had to pick and choose what I was gonna what I was gonna use today because there is actually quite a bit of detail on this subject. Now we're dealing a lot right now with Jews, right? Specifically with because the, the you know let me remind you the, the obviously the whole concept the whole sermon subject is on racism and how. The Bible teaches on it, how it's wrong. It's completely unscriptural. It doesn't matter where, who our descendants are from. But the majority of the teachings on this subject has to do with the Jews because that's who the, the primary focus is throughout the Bible, right? Is this people, this people that God has, has, has chosen and has made holy and has sanctified out of the rest of the world. And we saw in the opening chapter that the reason why he did it, it's not because they were some great, powerful nation, but it's because they were small in number. God said, oh, look, here's a real small group of people. Here's someone, and, you know, and with Abraham, he loved Abraham, right? Abraham was a friend of God. And he was a small, a small people. Someone who didn't have power, didn't have authority, you know, that was, would have been easy to just get kicked around. God likes protecting the, the poor and the needy and the, home, you know, and, and the people who are in need. God likes being the one to be the protector of those people. And... Um, he chose, you know, Abraham. He ended up chosen, choosing this, this, this seed of Israel, the, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and that lineage to build a nation out of, to be a, a, um, a lighthouse, to shine the truth of the gospel of God in an area of the world. And that's, and that's what he did. And it wasn't because of anything special that they did, but God, God uh, chose them and they were, they were a small people. But then all of a sudden, you know, they go from their humble beginnings. Abraham was a humble man. Isaac was a humble man. Jacob was a hum humble man, you know, until it grows into we are a superior people who can't even go out and, and hang out with someone of another nation. Colossians 3.10, you have to turn your, your, your turn to Romans 2. Colossians 3.10 says, And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. It doesn't matter. He says, there is Greek nor Jew. It doesn't matter what lineage you're of. It doesn't matter if you're of the Greeks. It doesn't matter if you're of the Jews. None of that matters. What matters is if you're in Christ. Amen. That's what matters. Romans 2.28 says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. Again, saying that just like he did with being a seed of Abraham, the physical seed doesn't matter. It's if you're a child of promise, if you have faith, then are you Abraham's seed. The same thing with being a Jew or with receiving any benefit of being a Jew in the Bible. You're not a Jew, which is one outwardly, which would be in the flesh, inwardly, in the heart. That is what would matter. If being a Jew matters at all, it only matters whether or not the circumcision of your heart is there and that your faith is in Christ. That is where the matter, that is where the, um, the important part is found. Look at verse number 9 of Romans 2. It says, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. It brings up Jews and Gentiles as being two different groups and then says there's no respect of persons with God. He said, look, if you do evil, you're going to get tribulation. You're going to get anguish. I don't care what your race is. And actually, I think the only time it does come into play is because of the Jew first and also the Gentile. It's not because of their physical heritage, though. It's because they were given 
the oracles of God. They had the knowledge, so they're going to be the first one. If they're doing evil, and just for you today also, Christian, if you have God's word, and you are, you, you are, you know, unto whom much is given, of him is much required. You know, God requires more of you when you have his words, when you, under, when you have the truth. So, of the Jew first, they had God's word. You know, the Greeks or the Gentiles, they didn't all have it. But if they do evil, they're also going to get judged. God's not a respecter of persons. He's like, I don't care where you were born. That doesn't matter. Only if you have been given, you know, extra opportunity, then he's going to require more of you, and you'll be the first one to get it. But all that do evil are going to be judged, just like all that do well will be blessed. So he's saying there, I'm not a respecter of persons. I don't care who your father was. I don't care who your grandfather was. I don't care who your great-grandfather was. Because when you go back far enough, we all have the same great, 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 great grandfather and Adam. We all have the same one, so it doesn't matter. You're in Romans 2, flip over to Romans chapter 9. Almost done. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 verse 3 says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So here he's talking about his, you know, this is Apostle Paul talking about his physical brethren, the other children, descendants of Israel. Okay? And what he's saying here, he says, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, the covenants, right? The covenants were given to the physical seed. The, the giving of the law was given to the physical seed. The service of God was given to the Levites, the physical seed, right? All these things were given unto, he's saying, look, they have all these things. To whom pertaineth? They, they, all these things pertain unto them. I want them to be saved is what he's saying. It says, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Jesus Christ was physically born a Jew. He was, you know, he was, came, he was descended of David. Who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God, verse 6, hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Again, I mean, how many places do we have to see this in the Bible before it's going to sink into our heads that it, this doesn't matter? Right. Seed of Abraham. He's talking about the physical seed of Abraham. Or they that are all, you know, not all Israel, which are of Israel, which means they're from, physically from Israel. They're not all of Israel. They're not all called Israel. Just because they were physically born of Israel does not mean they are Israel. They are part of Israel. Verse 7, Neither because they are seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. If you're born physically of the seed of Abraham, that does not make you a child of God. That does not make you saved. That does not give you any special credit or standing with God. It's always been about the promise. It's always been about the faith. It's always been, like Romans chapter 4 talks about Abraham. And Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. We saw the same thing in Galatians chapter 3. It's never been about the law. It's never been about the flesh. It's always been about the promises. And the promise is available to all because Christ died for all. Amen. So that faith in him makes you a child. If hey, anyone here is born again, look, we already have a culturally diverse group right here in our small church. And anyone here is born again, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That makes us of the same group or ethnicity or national, whatever you want to call it. We're brothers and sisters because God is our Father. And we ought to be treating each other as brothers and sisters. And not treating anybody any different based on the way that they look. Turn if you would to Esther chapter 8. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn. Esther in the Old Testament. We're almost done. Esther chapter 8. And see, I don't want you to get me wrong. I don't think you can based on everything I've said. It's not that I hate all Jews. I'm not here Jew bashing or something like that, right? It's a, it has nothing to do with the sermon. 
I want them to get saved just like the Apostle Paul did. He says in Romans 10, verse 1, he says, Brethren, you know, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I want them to be saved. You know, but then he goes on to explain, you know, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You know, and, and ultimately he explains that they're trusting in their works, they're trusting in their flesh. They're not trusting in the promise of God. And of course, one more proof that our heritage, our race, our, our ethnicity doesn't matter in God's sight, besides everything else that we've already seen, you know, in Titus 3.9, it says to avoid foolish questions and genealogies. Avoid genealogy. You know, the genealogy tells you who, you're, who you are descended from. Just avoid it. It doesn't matter. Who cares who you're physically descended from? Right. The only time that ever mattered at all was in part of the law for establishing who can do the service of, of, of the Lord in the tabernacle because that was given to physical descendants of the tribe of Levi. That's it. The priests and the Levites were doing the service of the Lord. And that was important for them to say, yes, this is who was given that um, inheritance and that, and, and, and that job that mattered for that time frame under the law until Christ came. But when the Levitical priesthood changed, it didn't matter anymore after that. Because now we're under the order of Melchizedek. We're under the, the order of Jesus Christ as our, as our priest. And, um, and none of that even matters whatsoever. And even then, it's not like it mattered to make you better than someone. It was just what your job function was going to be right. in serving God. And we're going to see that here in Esther chapter 8. Because even, like, n nobody can claim that they just have this pure blood, you know, Abrahamic genealogy. You can't prove that. None of those, you know, full genealogies exist. And I want to show you here in Esther chapter 8, this, this happened a long time ago. You remember in, 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 um, in Esther with, uh, you know, Mordecai and Esther and, and, and King Ahasuerus and... and um, Haman hated the Jews and he, you know, because of Mordecai, he's like, Mordecai's not bowing down to me and he, you know, he, wanted, he wanted them to submit and he's like, no, I'm not going to bow down to any man because I bow down and worship the Lord. Right? And he made that and The whole story in the, in the book of Esther, great story. But what happened here at the end, right? God delivers them. God gives them a great victory. All the people that hated him wanted him dead. They were allowed to fight back and they, and, and they were able to destroy all their enemies. And it was a great victory and, and a great celebration that, that God has delivered these people that were being oppressed and that, that had, um, you know, these other racists against them. And then um, it says in, in Esther 8, verse 17, look at verse 17 of Esther chapter 8. It says, And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. They became Jews. If it only it was, was something that, would, that you could do through being born into physically, then how could you become a Jew? I mean, it's about the many people of the land. How could you become a Jew? This means that there were Foreigners, there were people who were not of the seed of Abraham all the way back in this time. And I can't tell you exactly when this time was. I don't, I don't have that, that knowledge right now, memorize of, of, the, of you know, what year B.C. this was. It was a long time, right. a long time before Christ That's right. when, this, when these events happened. And to say at this point, during King Ahasuerus reign, there were people becoming Jews from outside of the physical seed? Well, once they've become Jews, you don't think they're going to be marrying and given in marriage within that, within that group of people. And it doesn't even tell you how many. It just says many, many of the people. So right there, I mean, oh, your bloodline's polluted. It's never been about the bloodline. Right. It's never been about that. Amen. It's been about the faith. And you know what? God has always wanted people to come to him. Always. Even when he chose his nation to, to give the gospel to. And you know, it makes sense that he chose a group of people to consist, you know, to, to reveal himself unto, to, to raise up prophets from, and to have an established, you know, hub to, to 
work with. And they were supposed to, you know, be able to evangelize other people and other nations were able to come to them and the other nations were supposed to hear and, and fear and, and, and hear the wisdom of the law and be like, wow, God must be with these people because they're so wise, because they have these great laws and everything else. That was the point. The point was never because God just wants to damn a whole world to hell except for these, this select group of people. Right. Never been like that. God's attitude has never changed. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's always wanted the unbelievers, the Gentiles, the Greeks, whoever it was, to repent of their false gods, repent of their idols, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord back then. Believe on the Messiah. Believe on the Savior. And get saved. And then be one of His people. Be a child of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the great um, honor and blessing it is to be called a child of God, dear Lord, that you have, have begotten us again just through faith in Jesus Christ, dear Lord, that we could all be brothers and sisters. God, I pray that you please help us not to be deceived by the media and by the, the prompting to to kind of take, take sides based on the color of our skin or where we were born or, or our physical heritage, dear Lord, that help us not to fall into that trap, that fleshly way of thinking of, oh, these people look different than me and, and they're coming against me and now we need to band together with, with our race and against their race, dear Lord. Help us never to do that, but that we would be able to um, just stand on your word as truth and help us to expose the lies of the, of the media, dear Lord, that are trying to, to cause these racial wars and divide the people, dear Lord. I pray that your people would never be divided, but that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we could unite all over the place to stand up against the evil and the spiritual wickedness in high places, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.